Well, greetings, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to uh, Capital Community College and the third of our four lectures uh, on Hartford history. And, and tonight we have Bill Hosley back with us uh, speaking on Hartford, uh, the, the paintings and uh, painters. And I think you're going to be thrilled with what you hear. Um, you all know Bill Hosley. Uh, we've introduced him before, and he's the curator of our series and puts together this series every year. Uh, so we want to thank him for his involvement at Capitol. Um, he has a lot to say about, about the paintings and painters. As many of you know, he was uh, a curator at uh, the Wadsworth Athenaeum, and he'll tell you a little bit about uh, the, the uh, tour that's going to be coming up this um, this. Uh, Saturday. So um, I would like to, before we start, just thank our, our, our sponsoring uh, agency that is Connecticut Humanities, who's, who has made the funding for this event and made this event possible. We want to thank them very much for their support. Would, I'd like to let everybody know that uh, we will be uh, recording this. We are recording this, and you will be able to find it on the Hartford Heritage Project website. If you look in the panel for chats, you'll see I've already put the information there with the link and also some information about how you can support Capital Community College and our programming. So welcome. I'm going to hand it over to Bill now, and uh, it's all yours, Bill. Hey, greetings. Thank you for those tuned in. And uh, uh, again, to reiterate, this tour Saturday morning, uh, I've never done this for the public before, but it's going to be a, a Hartford... Um, Art and Art Patrons theme, theme tour of Wadsworth Athenaeum inside, so it'll be a really, hopefully, wonderful experience. Tonight's program is titled Hartford Panorama, Sam Colt, Joseph Ropes, and the Great Flood of 1854. And this is another facet of the Colt story. There's so many. Uh, Coltsville National Park, when the time comes, is going to tell a lot of those stories and help put Hartford history on the map. So I love time travel. So let's go back to 1854. Uh, what a year it was. And look, we're all going through this pandemic and you think of no matter what age you are, there are some years that are kind of ordinary and there are other years that kind of are extraordinary and some of them good and not always so good. And we're going through some hard times, but boy, it was hard in 1854. The country was divided into sections by uh, by 1854 they kind of knew the civil war was coming and th this map shows the division between the slave states and the northern states and the west and everything was up for grabs uh in 1854 what was going on precisely that year the kansas nebraska act allowed people in the territories of Kansas and Nebraska to decide for themselves whether or not to allow slavery within their borders. And that brought John Brown out to Kansas and a lot of violence and, uh, uh, you know, uh, conflict came out of that. Uh, 1854 was also the year, some hard to imagine, but the, the know-nothings, you can Google it, were a political party that actually was dominant in Massachusetts for a while, nativist political party and movement that was anti-Catholic, anti-immigration. And this is a picture of know-nothing uh, agitators burning the Catholic Church in Bath, Maine in 1854. 1854 was the year the Republican Party was born in Wisconsin, of all places. Abraham Lincoln built his platform through that 1854 was the year Matthew Perry, Commodore Perry, uh, launched the Japan expedition that opened Japan to the West, one of the big events of the 19th century. Uh, 1854 is the year Henry David Thoreau published Walden, uh, the uh, milestone in American environmental movement. 1854 was the year that Colt's Armory, the building we know, was under construction. And by this point, Sam Colt was minting money and was achieving international success. We'll hear more about that, but it was an exciting time. And actually, 1854 was the year that Sam Colt uh, presented a lecture before the British House of Commons on the superiority of American manufacturing. That is 
uh, uh, illustrated on the Colt Memorial statue in Colt Park. 1854 was still the age of sail from the 16th century until the middle end of the 19th century. Sailing and travel by boat was how the world got around and how the, the Atlantic world was colonized and developed. And look on the left there, all the wharves. Hartford, you know, you, you wouldn't believe it today, but Hartford was a port city. And a lot of the economy of the city uh, was based on the port. That view in the lower uh, right there is a view of the port of Hartford as it might have looked about 1870. And then railroads had arrived in 1844. This is the first Hartford rail, Railway Station. And it gives you, again, a sense of the profound changes that were underway at that time. Uh, 1854 was the year that Bushnell Park was envisioned, sometimes called the first municipal public park in America. It wasn't built right then, but the, the legislation, the chartering of it, and some of the money to create it uh, started that year. And this incredible artifact from the High Museum in Atlanta, I wish it was in Hartford, but it was belonged to Charles Pond, who was the president of the Hartford New Haven Railroad. And it illustrates uh, New Haven Green, the Hartford Railway Station, and the Springfield Armory, the three icons of those respective cities here in the Connecticut Valley. Well, Sam Colt, what was he up to at that point? Three years earlier, he had represented the United States at the great exhibition, the World's Fair in London, where which inspired him and really put Hartford and Colt on the map. Um, by 1854, the Colt Armory was not completed, but it was underway. The construction was underway. This is the earliest illustration showing Colt's Armory from East Hartford view uh, of the city uh, at that time. Well, the sources, the kind of, the research resources that I use to put together this program are kind of available to anyone. And this is a city directory from 1854. And these directories are amazing because they give rundowns on the various trades, occupations, professions, professions and industries, a real snapshot of Hartford's community and economy at that time. And there's an index of all the advertisements. You've got furniture makers, carriage makers, brass founders, founders, book binders, tailors, clothing, watches, jewelry, all the things, architects and building builders, all the things going on in the city at that time. Uh, uh, machinists, insurance companies by 1854, uh, they were big. And so this is some of the, the research that I was able to do. And these are some of the Individual firms, gardening and nursery uh, company uh, run by George F. Like, well, Hartford is beginning to suburbanize at this point. And you've got people with these great estates that uh, have elaborate gardens. Uh, William Green in the middle here, a lithographer, uh, makes prints and uh, uh, artistic uh, pictures for sale. And then below is are the Blisses, a pistol maker, a carriage maker, and... J.W. Bliss, a solicitor of patents who makes patterns. So it gives you a real sense of what the uh, economy of the city was. Uh, this is one of the county maps of this particular one, a wall map from 1855, uh, just about the time we're talking about here, shows Hartford County, and it's got all these, in each individual town, and then all the pictures of some of the historic landmarks, and they weren't historic, they were new landmarks, and up close views of the uh, various uh, towns and cities. This is what, the, again, the uh, riverfront wharfs uh, in Hartford looked like in 1855, and a directory of some of the, the businesses that were here then. Uh, marble works, hotels, attorneys, uh, and then the printers and book publishing. People don't know uh, often that Hartford was a pretty important publishing center. Uh, there were about um, uh, eight or nine publishing companies. And, and then the Hartford Current, of course, uh, the Hartford Times newspapers, there were uh, three uh, different newspapers and nine book publishers at that time. The, 
In 1850, this is one of the great things. It's at Connecticut Historical Society, this um, map, this wall map illustrating every street, every house, every building, everything that was going on in 1850. So we're beginning to surround this moment uh, uh, that I'll be talking about in a moment. And uh, these are just some details uh, from that uh, uh, map, wall map from 1850 that uh, shows... Uh, on the, um, you know, you know, every building then standing is identified. It shows the area that became Bushnell Park before Bushnell Park even existed. Uh, shows Trinity College located on the present side of the Capitol. A granular look at a world that Ropes views would capture a world on the eve of the Industrial Revolution made possible by the arrival of railroads a few years earlier. This, again, is a view of the wharfs and the waterfront and who owned them, and then State House Square, uh, where the old State House is now. It was then the State Capitol. And a little hard to see some of these details. This shows Upper Main Street, and then on the right is Lower Main Street. If you look in the center there on the right, it says... Uh, John, John Butler, and that's actually about the only thing in that picture that's still standing, the Butler McCook House, and it was a full city lot that extended from Main Street to Prospect Street. Most of them have been broken up because actually Prospect Street in this period was entirely residential. People had some great houses in that downtown area. I also uh, used... Um, uh, the Connecticut State Library, this is the most wonderful research resource. You can search the Hartford Current online from 1864, 1764 when it was founded, till the 1920s. Anybody, any name, any business, anything going on in the current in that period is now searchable online through this company, ProQuest. And uh, you can get that by typing uh, icon.com and you'll find out how you can access the Hartford Current online. This is a bird's eye view, I'll get back to that later, from 1864, that shows the cityscape as it looked in Colt's time and in Joseph Ropes' time. Well, who is Joseph Ropes? He's sort of a forgotten figure, but he was one of the a handful of significant working artists living in Hartford and working here in the 1850s. And he grew up in Salem, Massachusetts. I wasn't able to do the genealogy to know if he was raised in this house, now a museum, but the Nathaniel Ropes Mansion in Salem, Massachusetts, shown here. He established himself as an artist in Hartford in 1851 and remained until 1865 when he traveled in Europe, resettled in Philadelphia, and spent the rest of his years or his later years in New York City. So Joseph Ropes got around and he may have grown up in that house in Salem. We don't have a portrait of him, but we do have these two portraits of Hartford artist contemporaries. Uh, on the left is Edward Bartholomew and on the right is Charles Loring Elliott. Both of them did work for the Colts, uh, undoubtedly knew Ropes and uh, were contemporaries in Hartford at that time. Uh, we can find through the newspapers that I was referring to advertisements by Hartford artists. This is a contemporary of Julius uh, of Joseph Ropes named Julius Bush, who taught drawing and painting in the latest approved methods from the modern schools of Europe, teaching painting in oil and watercolor, drawing, landscapes, flowers and figures, architectural and ornamental uh, drawing. So, you know, artists then and now, had to do a lot of things creatively to make a living. These are ads that appeared in the current from Joseph Ropes. He published a book in the 1850s. He also taught drawing and painting from his studio at 136 Main Street. He pops up as an exhibitor and award winner in the uh, Hartford County Agricultural uh, Fair. Uh, the, this was the primary venue. If you were an artist or a mechanic or anybody that made anything, uh, this was where you got made a name for yourself, is exhibiting in these agricultural fairs. He also produced um, these interesting uh, lithographic 
drawings that became lithographic print, prints, uh, uh, cityscapes, townscapes. Above is New London and below is Rockville, Connecticut. He did several of these. So he's, he's pretty good at rendering architecture in his drawings. And these are just a few paintings of his. I don't know. I know the Connecticut Historical Society has Joseph Rope's view. Last I looked on display. But uh, his pictures are rare, uh, but you can find them. Uh, and these are some of his landscapes. And these are some wonderful charcoal drawings of the Park River that he did that are at the Connecticut Historical Society. And again, these are, this is a little before the age of photography. So these artists are depicting a world that really can't be shown any other way, but through uh, hand-drawn illustrations. And a look at the Park River as we know it, so different. And then uh, a few years ago, the Wadsworth Athenaeum found in a, I don't know, a storage area somewhere, this collection of Joseph Rope's paintings, little paintings uh, of the city. And I, I, uh, they're, they're quite remarkable. This is shows the Park River and the Connecticut River. There's Colts Armory. It was probably painted the year it was finished. Uh, and then on the lower left is the Park River, where it feeds into the Connecticut River. And it shows uh, there were shipyards there and uh, the wharf and a depot for ships on the right in that picture. These are other views by Joseph Ropes, uh, more views of the Park River. Um, on the left is the location where the Soldiers' Arch is today. On the right is the Great Arch from the 1830s that was built there. Uh, it's still there if you know where to look on the Whitehead Highway. And th these are great. Joseph Ropes did these paintings. These are at Wadsworth Athenaeum, and they, it would be fun to do an exhibit someday on the Park River. Believe me, there's a lot of visual material. Okay, so the Great Flood of 1854, what was that about? Well, it was widely reported in the current. The rain that led to what became known as the Great Flood of 1854 began on April 27th, a Thursday. It rained hard and steady for the next three days. Monday's current observed that this city is now in the midst of the greatest freshet which has ever visited it, rising four inches per hour. All that part of our city contiguous with the Connecticut Mill Rivers is flooded and the North and South Meadows present to the eye one immense sheet of water. Smaller houses on the banks are submerged. The water covers all those parts of the city lying north of Pleasant and east of front streets it's and, and the mill river the factories of woodruff and beach fails and gray and colonel colt will suffer suffer heavily bridges swept away dwellings came down the river merchants doing business near the river were moving their goods up to the second stories city hall was opened to such families who were drowned out and noted that where the flood of 1801 was 26 inches 26 feet, and two inches above low water mark, this flood of 1854 rose to 27 feet, five inches. The Hartford Times, the other newspaper at the time, described it as the flood of the century, noting that it moved a large barn 11 feet, flooded Pearl Street halfway to Trumbull, and by Monday morning was 28 feet, 11 inches above low water mark. Colonel Colt's engineer, they reported, had about 100 laborers in the South Meadows throwing up large piles of earth as a foundation for the dike he was building. Flood it's all very ironic because the whole point of Colt's armory was to secure the floodplain from being flooded, and there it was flooded. But he hadn't finished it yet, protected against exactly this kind of situation. The flood covered the first floor of the Colts Armory building uh, that was in a different location at that time and submerged all the machinery. So this was really pretty much of a disaster. And, you know, we all know people who live here are accustomed to spring floods. These are views, but they aren't devastating in the way the Great Flood of 1854 was. There's a little story that pops up in the current during the flood of Sam Colt, the governor's horse guard. On Wednesday, it was reported that Colt 
dressed in his horse guard commander's uniform, which is shown on the left here, and it is at the Museum of Connecticut History, did an inspection with his troops. We don't have a picture of that, but we do know that he did it because it was reported. At some point during the flood, ropes ascended the center church steeple with a daguerreotype camera to photograph a city under siege. Sam Colt sponsored the effort and was himself fascinated by this new photographic technology. Invented in France in 1839, the current included, this is what I learned using the uh, website, the searchable website, 1,200 citations to daguerreotype photography between 1843 and 1856. So this was something that was very much on people's minds. He goes up to the, it was the highest point in Hartford, to the tower of Center Church and takes these photographs. And we know that because there's, uh, well, these are daguerreotypes um, uh, showing you the technology and uh, of daguerreotype production. Connecticut was actually in the business of making daguerreotype plates and frames. Uh, we know this because uh, the Museum of Connecticut History in 1957 were given the Colt Company archives. And within those archives is a single daguerreotype photograph showing the source, the basis for Joseph Rope's painting. So he went up the tower did this photography, most of the four photos are lost, and then spent several months making these paintings. Before the paintings were produced, he cranked out a lithograph for sale. Because people, this was a big dramatic event. And the lithograph was produced by Hartford's Kellogg, Kellogg Brothers lithographers uh, to show the flood of 1854 at Hartford. You can see, uh, the, uh, this was uh, taken probably from the old state house. And you can see State Street as it looked in exactly that moment. Well, the Ropes views uh, belonged to Sam and Elizabeth Colt. He commissioned them from the artist. He paid for them. He owned them. And when Elizabeth Colt died in 1905, she left them to the Wadsworth Athenaeum. And they are um, they show east and south because there is so much going on, it's hard to take it all in. And then, excuse me, north and uh, uh, west, and then east and south. And if you've ever seen these at the Wadsworth Athenaeum, you could spend an hour looking at them. There's so much detail. Um, well, why would Sam Colt, why would Colt do this? He was fine art obsessed. The 1850s was the first era in American history when art was front and center in the culture. There were no American art museums yet. In 20 years, there would be several, but collectors and patrons like the Colts were busy, busy collecting art. And the amazing thing, little known fact, this is, these are called lithophanes. And if you look at the picture on the left, all of those white panels in the windows at the Armsmere Mansion of the Colts are these lithophanes, these translucent were, pa pictures of works of art. He had more than a hundred of them and installed as window panes so that when you walked to the house, it was a veritable art gallery. It's an odd thing. The collection is also at Wadsworth Athenaeum. After Sam's death, his widow, Elizabeth Colt, uh, created the Colt uh, Memorial Art Gallery. She had Frederick Church, the artist, advise her that's a story unto itself. And again, her art collection was left to Wadsworth Athenaeum and is, uh, was the largest art collection in the city at the time. And, and she built this after his death in the 1860s. Uh, and these show the ropes views. And the amazing thing is these were originally installed on the top floor of the tower at Armsmere. And if you, it's one of the greatest rooms in the city. And if you were to go there, uh, you would see the shadow spaces above the windows where these were originally installed. And I think the idea uh, was um, so that you could go up there and look at the paintings and then look out the window and see the landscape that Sam Colt himself 
have changed so profoundly. So what I've done for this presentation is a lot of zoom in close ups so we can look at some details, just some of the things you can see. And, and again, one could spend hundreds of hours drilling down. We'll see how that works. Look, identifying almost every building in these pictures. Well, this is a view facing west and the big uh, subject in the middle of this is the 1844 railroad station, uh, which is the brown building in the center there. And, um, you know, what's also, I mean, so Hartford was so rich for so long that wave after wave of demolition and rebuilding largely eradicated the Civil War era city. These pictures document. Uh, so almost nothing in this picture it may in fact be that nothing in this picture is presently standing. This is a close up of that railroad station. So, you know, I mean, you really can look at these paintings almost with a microscope. I mean, they're so painstaking and they are photographic in their representation because they were based on photographs. Well, did you know that Trinity College was originally on the site of the present state capitol? That's the complex, the three buildings of Trinity College. And in the 1870s, the state of Connecticut bought them out. They moved to the South End, and these buildings were demolished. But they sure were there in 1855. And that is another part of the view facing west. Uh, this shows flooded houses. You have to look closely to see just how underwater many parts of the city were. Uh, uh, and. Uh, you know, it's all apparent there. Um, the Asylum for the Deaf, founded in 1817 as the Connecticut Asylum for the Education of Deaf and Dumb Persons, was, as it was originally known on Asylum Avenue, the present location of the Hartford Insurance Company, a federally chartered pioneering reform institution that put Hartford on the map. And this shows uh, the Hartford Asylum in that view facing west. And then I love this. You can see in the lower left there, in the ropes views, is the house that appears in the upper right. And that is also a painting by Joseph Ropes, but it's just a close-up of the Bliss House. Uh, and it's a painting that is on view at Connecticut Historical Society. The Bliss House was just about where Trinity College was at the head of present day Elm Street. What an elegant walking city this was, so layered with history. This is the views facing east. And of course, east from Center Church shows the Connecticut River, which went from being, you know, I don't know, 130 feet wide to a quarter of a mile wide because of the flood, it just, it just enveloped huge swaths of floodplain and land, but across, you don't see much detail of East Hartford, but that, that is the view of East Hartford underwater at a distance. Those ships in the foreground were probably parked at wharves that were then all underwater. Uh, facing East, we see Woodruff and Beach a Manufacturing Company on Arch Street, and Arch Street was the original manufacturing center uh, of Hartford and uh, Colt was near there. Uh, the Phoenix Iron Works were near there and everybody was getting wet <laughs> in April 1854. And then this is a, you really have to squint to, to notice these details, but that was the famous covered bridge. It was the largest covered bridge in the United States when it was finished. And I forget the year, if I ever knew it, when it was built, but it connected Hartford with East Hartford. It was replaced by what we now call the Putnam Bridge. And um, the stone bridge built in 1909, but it, it, you could see that the water was right up to the base of it. And... Um, there's a steamship in the foreground, may have had a Woodruff and Beach steam engine, but you can see those chimney stacks, uh, paddle wheel like uh, that plied the, the, the route from the Connecticut River to New York. And in the foreground is the third or fourth congregational church in Hartford, it's steeple, when Hartford astonishingly had four 
congregational churches in that one denomination. The Reverend Horace Bushnell was at that time the minister of the fourth congregational church and lived near the present location of the Keeney Clock Tower. Now, this is also uh, facing the east. This is, we talk about Front Street. This depicts it, building by building. This is what it looked like in 1854, all swept away by urban renewal in the 1960s. Uh, Porter's Manufacturing Company, the brick building on the right, is here was the largest and one of the first factory buildings in Hartford, built, I think, about 1848 owned by Solomon Porter. His tenant at the time was Colt's Armory because arm, Colt's factory, because the armory building that we know was just then under construction. Colt's office on the left had been there since 1854. And again, you have to squint almost with a microscope, but as you zero in, that's the Porter Manufacturing Company where Colt was located before he moved to the armory. And this shows the office. I love the people paddling by uh, the second floor as the first floor was undoubtedly flooded. So uh, Sam Cole had a real interest in this. I'm not exactly sure why, but these paintings are, there aren't five cities in America that are documented like this. Facing south, the Gothic spire of St. John's Episcopal Church on the present site of City Hall with the Connecticut River beyond. The Willis Estate, this is also facing south. No view would be complete without showing Hartford's then most famous estate and its beloved charter oak tree. Its days would end just two years later, but in 1854, the Willis Estate and charter oak occupied by Sam Colt's friend Isaac Stewart, shown on the left here, who had actually published the first history of Hartford a few years earlier. He was a, 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 a congressman, represented Hartford and Congress for a couple of years. And uh, again, this is some of the amazing details that you can spot in these ropes views. And Sam Colt, so story for another day, but was uh, really interested in uh, the Charter Oak. And when the tree died in 1856, he wound up acquiring most of the wood uh, from what was left of the tree and made this incredible chair, which is on display at Wadsworth Athenaeum, and this book, the story of his life, bound in the wood of the Charter Oak, uh, is at Wadsworth. Both of these are at Wadsworth Athenaeum. And, you know, just to give a plug to the National Park in Coltsville, one of the many things that makes the Colt legacy so important is Elizabeth Colt's work in preserving this incredible collection. Uh, there is not another industrialist in America of this period whose legacy is, is preserved. So many of the artifacts, so much of the written record is intact that you really have a lot of material to work with. Um, this view shows the uh, Baptist church uh, in the foreground, no longer standing, but also just behind it in brick, South Congregational, uh, still very much standing. And uh, that's a view south. And you can see you don't have to go very far south of there before it's farmland. Mm -hmm. 1854, uh, Hartford was still agricultural. And the regions and towns around Hartford were extremely agricultural. And this little detail of that actually shows uh, the Butler McCook House with its yellow roof line peeking out, the only building still standing in Hartford uh, from when George Washington last visited in, in 1789. Now, 1789 is a long time before 1854, but everything that was standing in Hartford in that the era that McCooks built that house has been wiped out. The map on the right actually shows in the center on the right of Main Street, the uh, Butler Estate, as I mentioned earlier, it went from it was a long lot that went from Main Street to Prospect, and it's interesting how Prospect was primarily residential. It's amazing that in 1854, Main Street Hartford was still primarily residential, um, and uh, this is East Hartford again. Uh, the river is lake somewhere in here is the South Meadows where Coltsville would eventually emerge after 
after the flood control embankment that was then under construction. So a lot of content here. Then the view facing north. Uh, my favorite view in a way, because the old state house, which we still very much have, it was then the state capital, the most prominent landmark in the ropes views is the 1796 state house and what is now called state house square with the U.S. hotel on the left, the Eagle Hotel, Calhoun Brothers printers on the right. I mean, the ability to, I mean, the, the little sign that identifies what the building was is uh, prominent within those views. Note folks on the roof of the state house viewing the records and the dense housing and evidence of a thriving walking city. Beyond the cupola of the old state house, the little white building on the right actually was city hall. I don't know if there's another image of it that survives because it was eventually replaced a couple times. I think they moved in to the old state house in 1870, so I, maybe there's a photograph around, but that's amazing. And this just shows some of the other sources of imagery of the hotels uh, that existed uh, up and around. Uh, these are actually taken from the wall maps I showed earlier, and the American Hotel and the Eagle Hotel were right there in uh, State House Square. Other views, looking up Main Street, we see yet more houses of worship, including the Second Congregational Church and Trinity Church Episcopal on the left, which is right across the street from where I'm standing right now in the old G. Fox building, home of Capital Community College. And they, uh, my friend Jeff Partridge gets to look out the window every day. That is a great yes. Trinity Church, what now called Christ Church Cathedral. They used to have uh, Trinity College's gradu graduations were held there every year. It's an extraordinary l landmark. And anyway, that shows what it looked like during the Great Flood of 1854. Uh, uh, St. Patrick's Catholic Church and a wide range of houses, mostly from the first half of the 19th century. The amazing thing is if somebody spent 100 hours at it, they could probably identify most of what's in these pictures. Uh, and just the Ice and Terry House, interestingly enough, property of Connecticut Landmarks, it's a museum, was built in 1854. I don't think it appears, or maybe I haven't looked close enough in the ropes views, but it was going up that year, and it's one of the great houses of that era in Hartford. Uh, and this shows that neighborhood the way it looked 100 years ago. And of course, uh, we've had a lot of they put the interstate highway through the center of the city, and then there was urban renewal. But the Isham House was a really an extraordinary location. And again, this lovely walk-in city. You could walk from here to Hartford High and the railroad station in three minutes, mm. uh, the corner of Walnut and High. Although produced a decade later in 1864, this bird's-eye view print is an, exa an example is actually on display at the Butler McCook House is another remarkable resource for documenting Hartford's industrial age. The train station that I showed earlier is still apparent in the foreground, but in the foreground is Sharp's Rifle Works near the present site of the Hartford Current. In the upper right is the then, way up in the upper right corner is the then completed Colts Armory Complex. In the center is Bushnell Park, conceived but not begun uh, in 1854. This print was published by the park's landscape architect, Jacob Wiedemann, shown in the upper left there, probably to promote his urban park masterpiece. And we do love uh, our Bushnell Park, which appears in this picture almost dead center. And that's a close-up. Isn't it great? And the fountains, I mean, a lot of it has changed. You can see the bridge I illustrated earlier. Uh, it's on the location of the present Soldiers and Sailors Arch, but this is before the Soldiers Arch was built. In the lower right there is Trinity College, still there. This, again, is not 1854, it's 1864. But wouldn't you like to walk around this lovely 19th century city? And the Park River, still above ground, this, you know, waterway uh, that uh, is still there, but it's buried. And again, uh, it would be 
the churches and churches galore, a story for another year. Religion was the foundation of the civic rectitude that made Hartford so prosperous. And that is a topic, maybe somebody will research this, but there's a big story in that. Look at all, all the churches along Main Street, and that wasn't the half of them. In the upper right, you can see where the Park River exits the um, land into the Connecticut, feeds into the Connecticut River, and the very right corner is Colts Armory from this, oh, there's a detail from the uh, bird's eye view of 1864. So there's a lot to go on. This I've already mentioned is the um, Sharps Rifle Works. And Sharps, Hartford had two major gun factories in this period. There was Colt Armory, which is uh, a famous, but at the time that Ropes made his panorama, uh, Sharps may actually have been larger than Colts, and their building, now demolished, is shown in this picture there. On the upper left is a Sharps uh, rifle. These were used in the Civil War. John Brown acquired a bunch of them for his famous raid on Harper's Ferry, and, and on the far right there is an example of the an, an engraved, beautifully decorated rifle. If you want to learn more about Hartford Firearms, the Museum of Connecticut History has, and the Springfield Armory in Springfield, Mass., uh, whether it's your cup of tea or not, there's no better place in America to learn about this topic than here in the Connecticut Valley, the Gun Valley as it was once known. Uh, this, again, is the Asylum for the Deaf and the reser city reservoir behind it. It's all pretty breathtaking, if you ask me. Alas, last Sunday, the Hartford Current had a big editorial that advocated for the state, our government, now hemorrhaging in debt to spend $12 million more million propping up Connecticut's numerous performing arts venues, which I'm all for in a way. But here's an idea I like better. It's based on a museum display that inspired me as a kid growing up in Rochester, New York, a city very much like Hartford. For a fraction of the 12 million uh, of the cost, wouldn't it be awesome to build a large scale diorama to bring all this documentation to life? Thanks to Joseph Ropes and Sam Colt, Hartford is one of the few cities in America that could accomplish such a thing with photographic accuracy. Install it at the old State House or CHS or the Science Museum. Make it interactive so that with the click of a mouse, visitors can learn the who's, what's, and why's of 100 plus buildings around the city. It would be the coolest interactive display on the planet. Combine that with a tourism development strategy linked to place based education strategy for the schools, and guess what we'd have? the power of love, mm -hmm. civic pride, live it, love it, and it will prosper and grow. Thank you all so much for uh, uh, those who have logged in. Uh, this will be online later for those that haven't. If there are any questions or how does it all work, Jeff? Well, we have time for questions. And uh, as I put in the chat feature, if you are interested in asking a question, just raise your hand. Uh, there's a raise hand function. I will look for you, and the first one I see, I will open your microphone so that you can speak. So do we have any questions? Comments. Or comments. <laughs> Feedback. I hope you're speechless, because I really was creating this. It was so much fun. <laughs> We've got 22. Well, 20 people now. I'm not seeing. I'm not seeing any raised hands. So if you're having trouble uh, getting your hand raised, uh, go ahead and send a chat. Uh, just say you want your mic turned on, and I'll see you. Uh, okay. Wait. I see something. Oops. Yes, uh, wait, who is, right. how come I'm not seeing hands raised? This might be my problem. Uh, 
Um, let's see. I see. I would be interested in seeing a replay. Uh, Jer let's see. Ne Nevin Carling, I'm going to uh, get you on here in just a second. Uh, okay, here we go. Allow. Unmute. Hey, you guys. Uh, Nevin. Hey, Nevin. <laughs> How's it going? Uh, great. Um, I am really still quite interested in the um, in in Dutch Point around the Colt Factory where the Hoos the Hoop used to be, um, and the whole settlement that was there. And um, I mean, I have scoured that um, aerial view looking for standing buildings from the original fort and. Um, even in one of your presentations from a year or two ago, you actually found a, uh, a Dutch house. I think the photo was taken in 1852. Um, yeah. You can see the Amos Bull House chimney in the, in the background and even some of the Charter Oak. Um, but as seeing as the, the Colt Factory Park is being developed, is there any chance to talk about or 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 make reference to um, the the Dutch settlement that was there. I mean, I've talked to you a lot about it in um, yeah. David De Vries's diary. He gives the measurements oh, of wow. the, yeah. of the the actual who's the hoop, um, and a lot of the inventory of the house. And I keep thinking, wouldn't it be awesome to just rebuild yeah. that? Well, you know, uh, uh, another little known detail, Sam Colt was fascinated by all these layers of history. And, and one of the reasons the streets in Coltsville have Dutch and Native American names is because working with the historian Isaac Stewart, who I mentioned, uh, mm. Colt laid out all these streets with those names to remind people of the history of that location. At the southwest corner of Coltsville, he actually built a Dutch windmill that was a oh, symbol cool. of this whole Dutch heritage. I don't. There are no photographs of it, and right. it, I don't think any evidence of it survives. But the question of whether archaeology might turn up some evidence is a very good question. Uh, Wadsworth Athenaeum has in its collection some fragments of pottery that Sam Colt uh, uh, preserved because mm -hmm. when he was building the armory, they, they did some archaeology and they discovered some things. I think the Connecticut Historical Society has a brick yeah, <laughs> from the they original... Do have a brick. Yeah, I mean, that's that's about it. But I... It, the. I, I may be wrong about this. I'm no expert. I, I think the Dutch had given up and left by the the late 17th century. So they're, it's pretty early. And they right. maybe that settlement and buildings were still around for 75 or 80 years, but I don't think they made it to 100. And right. that was long ago. So, you know, it, it, it's all part of... I mean, yeah, I think it would be great to... Uh, I mean, the whole idea of Adrian's Landing uh, was to remind people of this Dutch heritage. And at one point, there was a plan to create a uh, reproduction of Onrust. Well, there is a reproduction of uh, Adrian Block's boat that the Connecticut River Museum down in uh, Essex uh, uh, operates. So, you know, again, this rebuilding connective tissue between the past and the present always work. And, uh, you know, we're getting there, I guess, but uh, it's hard. Yeah, agreed. Thank you so much Thank for weighing in. Thank you, Nevin. I'll send you um, that tonight, too. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, going to... Um, I see that... Um, Donna Matulis had a had, uh, had a comment. Uh, Donna, I don't know if you want to state it out loud here, but I'll put you on to see if you want to. Donna, are you there? Donna? Maybe not. Okay. Is there something written? Uh, yeah, yes, she was... Uh, 
She said, I, I don't have a microphone right now, but I wanted to let you know how much I enjoyed this. Excellent. And I do love Hartford. The diorama is a great idea. It's great. Uh, go ahead. Okay. Is there anybody else who has a question? I'm sorry that uh, I see the Chris Linquist is asking something. So let me try oh. Chris. Um, Chris, can you, can you hear us? Yeah, Bill, how are you? Can you hear me, Bill? Hey, yeah, Chris, great to hear you. I'm Bill, so happy that you're I, in Farmington. I, I, I just wanted to say I always love listening to you, and I, I, I've taken a few tours with you, and I, I come out, you know, uh, so informed and excited about your passion for history. And so I just wanted to thank you. And I'm now in the Farmington Library, Bill. I, I, I know that. My your, old, your old friend John Tian is a trustee. So kudos. So, Watch your back. He's dangerous. <laughs> so, as, as a Trinity alum, I just wanted to acknowledge that Trinity College was called Washington College during the time period you're, you're discussing. When, when did they change the name to Trinity? I think it was uh, the time when they moved from where the state capital is uh, oh. over to the current location. Fast. Okay. I did know it was Washington College, and I didn't know when they changed it. So, uh, that's great. And, you know, sometimes when I've given tours of the state capitol, there is a big bronze bar relief right on the capitol building that shows that represents those three buildings as they looked at the time. So Trinity really did have pride of place in the center of this picture. And it's, um, um, yeah. you know, they got a lot more real estate in the south end. So it's probably That's better. True. Thanks, Bill. Thanks. Thank Chris. you, Chris. Good to see you. Um, apologies to Donna. I see when she said I don't have a mic, she means she really doesn't have a mic. Yeah, not because I didn't turn it on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, I don't see any other questions coming up. Uh, last chance, if you have one, just, just type into chat and say, I have a question. I'll see your name and I can put you on. I'm sorry the raise hand feature doesn't seem to be showing up in this. All right. Okay, well, Bill, maybe you could tell us a little something about what's happening on Saturday. Oh, yeah, Saturday morning at, at uh, 10 a.m., there's going to be a live stream tour of Hartford Art and Art Patrons at Wadsworth Athenaeum. We're going to start outside. We're going to go through the building. And it's, you know, a lot of this technology we're just figuring out, uh, but it is going to be a Facebook live stream uh, that comes out of the historic Hartford Facebook site. And uh, it will be a permanent video record, so I'm sure we can distribute it in other ways after the fact. But if you want to be part of the live action Saturday morning, we're uh, going at 10 uh, in the morning, and I think the Athenaeum curator, Brandy Culp, may be joining us, so maybe there'll be some interaction between us. And, you know, one doesn't think of the Wadsworth uh, in terms of, like, Hartford art. What is Hartford art? Well, there's a lot there, and it's a way of looking at it uh, that is a little different. Of course, they also have these amazing patronage stories. J.P. Morgan, Sam Colt, and Elizabeth Colt, the Wadsworth himself, the Goodwin family. So... One of the things that makes Wadsworth Athenaeum so distinctive and unusual is these Hartford-based patrons that uh, supported it and invested in it and donated things to it. It's, it's, it's really quite remarkable in that way. So that's what we're going to be looking at Saturday morning, live stream on the historic Hartford Facebook site, and I hope some of you join us. All right. So... Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Thank you, Bill, for a stimulating lecture. And we look forward to seeing you back here in two weeks uh, when we have another lecture. Uh, do you want to say something about yeah, that? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, we're going to hear from Tracy Wilson uh, two weeks from tonight about this is the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage, women getting the vote. And this is about Hartford's role in the women's suffrage movement and some interesting personalities. Uh, Tracy Wilson is, uh, she's now retired, but for many years she taught uh, at Hartford High, uh, uh, excuse me, West Hartford. Uh, and she's one of those wonderful, rare teachers who used 
Hartford and local history in her teaching. She was doing place-based education before it had, had a name. And so she loves this stuff, and I'm sure it'll be really interesting. And that's a, two weeks from tonight, same time, same place. And we'll be promoting that in every way we know how. Thank you. Okay. Good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us.